Well, hi and welcome to the Oatana Today Show, your community connection since 1991. Today is Wednesday, August 9th of 2017. My name is Pete Connor. I'm your show's host and we're going to have um, a throwback uh, to a recent show on convenings uh, that having to do with um, end of life issues and Dr. Simon Middle will be with us to share his knowledge about the need to have the conversations about end of life issues. And after that, we're going to go off to Cuyuna country for a look at the, the place where, as Leanne to told me, I probably should know that, is where the space program was founded. Uh, before that, however, we want to hear from you. Uh, what do you like to see on Oatana today? Who would you like to have on as guests? If you know of someone who needs some recognition or an event that needs some publicity, why don't you let us know by giving us an email at oatanatoday at charter.net or by calling Leanne at 390-5751. And now we're going to take a quick break for some messages from our sponsors, and we'll be right back with Dr. Middle. So please, don't go away. Hi, I'm Jody Voison with the staff at Fairview Animal Medical Center, your other family doctor. Fairview Animal Medical Center is a proud supporter of the Oatana Today Show. Hi, I'm Betsy Linger from the Oatana Foundation. Your generosity has made Oatana a better place to live by benefiting our community, the arts, recreation, and education. Please consider a donation today. The Oatana Foundation is a proud sponsor of the Oatana Today Show. It's fair time again, the 2017 Steele County Free Fair in Owatonna, Minnesota's biggest county fair, August 15th to the 20th. 40 thrilling rides on the Gold Star Midway. David Smith Jr. is back for two human cannonball shots daily on the Midway. Eight great grandstand shows, beer garden entertainment every day, free outdoor entertainment stages, over 100 food booths and 300 indoor displays. Scream and moo with much to do the 2017 Steele County Free Fair in Owatonna. Welcome back to the Owatonna Today Show, your community connection. And we were recently on location at the Engaged for Life Senior and Caregivers Expo, and we had a discussion with the keynote speaker, Dr. Simon Middle, about the conversation. Hi, Dr. Middle. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge with us today. Um, before we get into the subject at hand, would you please share a little bit about yourself and how you ended up back here in Owatonna? Sure. Well, it's been a joy to be back in Owatonna. Um, I was here six years ago um, is when I left. I currently live up in cities and I work in senior care. I work in uh, with nursing homes, providing care on site, and we deal with this issue a lot. And so I'm excited to be here today. What, are, what is it that you do uh, up in the, the cities right now? Uh, do you specialize with uh, that industry? Or? Yes, we're very much involved in what's happening in the senior care population, um, both inside nursing homes and outside. And uh, we're providing a lot of support and uh, fit, uh, provider services, medical services, to help them really navigate some of these very challenging issues. Now, the conversation we're going to have today is the elephant in the room. It is. The conversation we probably all need to have. Yeah. So why don't you shed some light on that? Sure. What is the conversation? Sure. The conversation is really the, the most important conversation that we're not having. Um, and it's about death. And, and we're very uncomfortable about talking about it in ways that can help us really understand how would we like to die? And when we think about that, I, I think um, the studies would show that most people are not having this conversation. We're thinking a lot about it, and I think we want to have the conversation, but we're not really absolutely having that in ways that allow our loved ones to know what we really want at the end of our lives. And also with our healthcare providers and healthcare teams, how do they know that um, we're going to follow the wishes. We're going to keep dignity as a high priority in these interactions that we have at the end of life. When is the right time to have, I know timing's everything. Yes. When is the right time? Yeah, there, the, the, there's no perfect time because everybody feels so uncomfortable with the issue. Um, what I find is that setting time aside and really thinking through what it is you're wanting and what you want to say um, and then recording that in a way that allows people to know exactly what what you would want during some of these very, very challenging times. I would say when not to have the conversation <laughs> is not in the um, emergency room, 
when, or a medical crisis situation, um, those become very challenging because there's so much emotion wrapped around what's going on and there's so much information that are coming at both the patient and their families to make decisions that are very, very important to them. When you have the conversation, what are some points mm -hmm. that should be included in that conversation? Sure. I think it's important to, for people to, to be able to express, what do I really want at the end of life? What are the things that are really important to me? Um, so for example, is it important that you're in a hospital or at home? Is it important that you're um, treating pain, treating discomfort? Is it important that you prolong life? Is it important that um, you have uh, the ability to say goodbye to your loved ones or to be able to communicate with your loved ones? Um, those become really important value statements that help you as an individual decide, this is how I want this to go. Most, of the, most people would say they don't want to die in a hospital, and yet in this country, most people do die in hospitals. And so if that's not what you want, how can we change that? How can your loved ones help you in that and recognize that that's not what you want? Uh, most people may not want to be on a breathing machine, for example. Okay, so what does that mean, and how do we now provide the right support? Yeah. What are some of the documents that would assist a family in having the conversation? Sure. So we talk, we talk about advanced care planning, which, re, which is really a way of thinking through um, what do I really want. We want to record that in a couple of different documents. The first one is the health care directive. And the health care directive, also known as the living will, can do several things. It can allow you to assign a health care proxy, so somebody who can make health care decisions when you can't make decisions for yourself. It can also outline very specific treatments, and it can do one or the other or both of those things. We recommend that both are in that document, that there's a, a real clear understanding of uh, what you would want and what you don't want, and also that there's somebody that you really trust and have had the conversation with who can uh, be your healthcare proxy. Okay. So the, if you have the paperwork in line, it, does it take the pressure off the family? Oh, or? very much so. And, and oftentimes, and, and many of us in healthcare have seen this, where there's a lot of um, discomfort and a lot of different opinions that come to light. And so what becomes real difficult in that is how do we have uh, a way to, to clear the air and mm -hmm. make sure that we've got the right things in place. All right. You said not to necessarily use a shock factor in just presenting this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, how should it be administered? Is it something that we do all in one sitting? Sure. Most of the time, no. Most of the time, we really want to have this over time because people need to think through their, their process and they need to think through their answers. And as loved ones, we have our own emotional pieces that we've got to kind of manage and deal with. So it is something that I recommend having over time in multiple conversations. And also to remember that the decisions made aren't written in stone and can be changed. I think those things become real important factors. Mm -hmm. How did you become an expert in this area? Well, I, unfortunately, I've had, I've had very personal experiences, both with my mother and my father. I'm sorry. Um, I thank you for that. Uh, my mother passed away when she was 51, and um, just really seeing her go through a very difficult time in her death process was very challenging. Um, there was a lot of denial. There was not really a conversation. She went through procedures that um, really were, were very uncomfortable for her. My father passed away recently in January, and he had a very different death experience where he passed away quietly, peacefully, loved ones around him. But we had had a conversation about what he wanted and, and it made all the difference in the world. So it became a very personal thing and, I, and being in the field that I'm in, um, seeing the discomfort and the challenges that both patients and families face um, when we have options, we have ways of having this, this conversation in a way that really allows people to be more settled. And so personal experience uh, really is a driver for you. Oh, absolutely. Um, also, you said a, a child that's later in life, us baby boomers, yeah. you know, we're all getting later in life, ever having parents that yeah. are later in life due to our healthy living, mm -hmm. things yeah, like that. Right. Um, so this conversation can be had on both sides at the same time. Absolutely. And, and it's really interesting when you start having these conversations as a family, people will start to offer here's what I want as well. You know, they, they start to offer those things. And it may not be a complete conversation, but it, it's a conversation that allows that to continue over time. Mm -hmm. And it can be fun. It can, I mean, even though right. the, the topic is, is serious and it's sad, but it, I think if it's done in advance, it can almost be fun, you know, 
a fun thing to kind of tease each other a little bit about right. it. And, and you can do some reminiscing and there's some fun things you can think about and, <laughs> and um, you know, you can be kind of silly about it as well, yeah. you know, well, I don't, I know I don't want to be stood on my head, for right. example, you know, so there are right. definitely some fun things you can do with it. Not that it's a fun issue, sure. but it's a serious issue. Um, can you tell, share with us some of the myths about hospice? Sure. So hospice is really um, widely used now, um, and it's used not only for terminal illness, it's really used in a way to say, can I help an individual be comfortable? Um, can I help them really ma ma manage their symptoms so they're not in pain, they're not short of breath, they're not in um, discomfort? They may be in a dying process, but there are times that people graduate hospice and they mm -hmm. actually do well because we've managed their symptoms well. So don't sh necessarily shudder. Sure. Would you explain in the different uh, paperwork documents you talked about, one that was unique to me, and maybe you could clarify quickly here, is uh, the PULSE. Yeah, the PULSE stands for the Provider Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, and it's divided into three different sections. Uh, one is whether you want CPR, mm -hmm. and um, the, the next is really a description of what, do you, what are your goals, what are you trying to accomplish. And then the third section really talks about specific treatments that you may want or you, you may not want. And so it allows the provider to really know that. And it is signed by the doctor, so it actually becomes an order that can now be used by the healthcare community. And could you explain how that could be used quickly at a 911 situation sure. as well? Absolutely, and that's a very common scenario where 911 is called. If that document is available, it can give direction to the paramedic saying, okay, here's what I know I can, I, mm -hmm. I, what this individual would want versus what they wouldn't want. And now that can help direct the treatment and, and really help individuals get what they want mm -hmm. and um, be respected. And quickly, what are the two things needed to make these documents legal? So you need, do need a witness, and you also do need um, a notary signature on, on the document, and okay. that, that does make it um, uh, a legal document. Where they would have to carry it Correct. out or whatever. Correct. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for having the conversation and sharing all your knowledge with us. You've thank probably you. made it easier and helped others to take a first step. So well, thank you so much, thank you so much Dr. Middle. I appreciate that. Yes. We will take a short break to hear a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. So please stay with us. Hi, I'm Jean Newkirk, personal banker here at Bremer Bank. Come see me today for our current retail loan specials and any of your banking needs. And I'm Ryan Gillespie, mortgage loan officer here at Bremer Bank in Owatonna, and I'm happy to help you with all of your home loan needs. Come see us today. Owatonna Public. A voice you can talk to We're growing with you With you in mind And everything we do Oh, a ton of public utilities Since 1988, the Owatonna Area Business Development Center has been the part of the success of many area businesses. The center leases office space and manufacturing space and offers on-site business consulting. The Owatonna Area Business Development Center is in business to help your business be a success. Hi, I'm Rick Smith, golf course superintendent of the Brooktree Golf Course. Brooktree is an 18-hole championship golf course featuring well-manicured greens, tees, and fairways. We are open to the public. I challenge you to find a better maintained golf course for the money we charge here at Brooktree. Come on out and play Brooktree, a great golf course. Leanne on the go for the Owatonna Today Show, and the trip that we're on today is we're heading up to the Cuyuna country. I'll give you an idea here on the map where that is. Actually, Crosby Ironton area. Down here is Minneapolis, and we're coming all the way up here west of Mille Lacs Lake and up into the Crosby Ironton area, which is this. See where the road kind of curves up and then down again. 
And actually, Crosby Ironton is actually located between Bemidji and Mille Lacs Lake. This close-up map will give you a better idea of the area that we're going to be exploring. Here we have Crosby, Ironton, and the two towns actually kind of run right into each other. And as you see, there is a number of lakes that um, are in this area. So we're going to explore this area and find out more about it. A good place to start to find out about the history of the Crosby, Ironton area is right here at the Sioux Line Depot. That's been turned into a museum, an interpretive museum of the history of the area. We've come into the museum now, and I have here, who, who do I have here with me? My name is Jim Nelson. Okay, Jim. Yeah. And I'm a member of the uh, Cuyuna Country Heritage Preservation Society that now has jurisdiction over the mu uh, museum. Okay, terrific. I've got a couple of questions for you to give people an idea about the history of the area. Okay. First of all, why is this portion of Minnesota referred to as Cuyuna Country? How did that get its name? Okay, Kyler Adams was somebody that found the iron ore, and he had a large St. Bernard dog, and the dog's name <coughs> was Una. And Kyler's wife went ahead and after they'd found ore and kind of came together on that, she named the, 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 the or made the name Cuyuna using the first three letters of Kyler's name and then the dog's name, U-N-A. <laughs> oh, that's really amazing. Now, after Kyler found um, the iron ore deposits here in this area, then how did the town of Crosby come to be? Well, when the mining first started, and there's many little towns around here that have pretty much disappeared, but Crosby was the biggest, and George Crosby, been up in the mines up in, in Hibbing in Virginia and the miners were living in lousy conditions and he wanted to have a place for the miners to live in a decent location with de decent housing and so in about 1908 the first mine started working and in 1910 the city of Crosby, named for George Crosby, okay. was uh, officially um, uh, settled or, or uh, can't think of the word. Platted and incorporated. And in, yeah, in, incorporated. Okay. All right. And then um, now for how many years um, was mining conducted in this area? Well, it basically started back in about 1908. And I think the last mine quit shipping ore uh, in, in the very early 70s. Okay. But uh, the, the mines went ahead and were going good, and then they didn't need the ore anymore. They were getting it from somewhere else. And then when World War I took off, that brought more mining, and there was a lag period in the center of that. And when World War II started, they needed all the iron they could get. Okay. So approximately how many pits were actually um, made around here? I mean, there are a number of lakes that actually are, were originally iron ore pits, but then when mining ceased then, they were allowed to naturally fill up with water, correct? That's correct. Uh, our ore here and our land here is different than the Mesabi Range. Our ore is wet. Theirs is dry. I see. Theirs was not mag magnetic, so they had to run it through a cindering plant <coughs> and actually, like, burn it, heat it to a very high temperature. That, that would eat, break off all of the uh, other material. And when the ore came back out of there, it was then magnetic. Oh, really? That's <coughs> very interesting. So, well, I thank you so much for, for your time spent with us, giving us a little bit of history of the area. Um, we're actually going to go out to some of the, the, the sites here in the area and uh, show some people some of the lakes that have actually been formed from the original pits that have now filled in with water. Yeah. Um, we had two different kinds of mining up here. One was underground mining. Oh, okay. And... <coughs> 
lot of them became open pit mines. Uh, and the open pit mines, we've got a mine up here in the Portsmouth that's 400 feet deep. Oh, wow. And we'll actually show that, like, because uh, there's a really nice little uh, campground that the, yes. that the DNR has, has put together on Portsmouth Lake. So, yeah. well, thank you so much for your time, and thanks for appearing on the Oatana Today Show with us. That gives you a very brief look of what you can find here in the Sioux Line Depot Museum. There's also some history behind the um, space exploration, too, here in the museum, which we don't have time to go into, but for sure, you really need to stop off here. This should be your first uh, stop off here as you come into the Crosby-Ironton area. We're driving down the main street of Crosby and for a small town its population is about 2300. Um, it really has quite a vibrant main street and for, your, for you antiquers they have seven antique stores here in downtown Crosby. Here now straight ahead you can see the sign that says Crosby established 1910 and there's a picture of the serpent and we'll tell you a little bit more about the serpent in our next segment we're heading on our way from Crosby into Ironton and actually the two cities kind of melt one right into the other right now we're still in, in Crosby but we get up here, right here, and there's the sign. Here's Ironton. And now we're in Ironton. One of the landmark buildings here in Ironton is the Spina Hotel. I'm not sure what year the hotel was built, but it was a pretty thriving hotel, especially in the early years of, of mining. Now I understand that the building itself is owned by the Perpich family. You remember Rudy Perpich was governor of the state of Minnesota. And one of his sons has a dental office here in the building. Um, this front part is an old bar, but unfortunately the bar is not open. Uh, one of the locals tells me that everything is pretty much the same in the bar area as it was when it was a bar and then some family members continued to live upstairs in what used to be the old hotel rooms. But it's a really neat landmark right here on Highway 210 in Ironton. From a distance you're looking at the water tower of Ironton and what you see before you is what's left of the Portsmouth Pit Mine iron ore pit mine. This was the deepest mine in the area. It was over 400 feet deep. And now the water that you see filling up here in the very middle of the lake, that would be 400 feet worth of water. In speaking with Mr. Nelson at the Historical Museum, he said that the iron ore is, st there's still a lot of iron ore left in this region that could be mined. However, the cost of mining it right now is much more expensive than importing iron ore from other countries. If they should ever decide that they wanted to, say for instance, reopen this pit, they would need to have at least four water pumps pumping 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at the cost of a minimum of $1,000 a day for electricity to empty all of the water out of the Portsmouth Iron Pit. But right now it's just a beautiful recreational lake. We see a fishing boat on there. And it has been stocked with rainbow trout, among other species of fish by the, by the DNR. So this gives you a good look at once was the Portsmouth Iron Ore Mine. We'll leave you today with a view of Portsmouth Pit Lake, where the Portsmouth Pit Mine was. And um, we hope that you've enjoyed this quick tour of the Crosby Ironton area and the Cuyuna Country State Recreation Area. Cuyuna Country is a 5,000 acre treasure and it's one of Minnesota's newest state recreation areas. There's so many activities available here, includes, including diving and snorkeling, 
in the pit mine lakes. Fishing, hiking, mountain biking, they've just completed a whole series of mountain biking trails. Off-road trail riding, bird watching of course, nature viewing, picnicking, sightseeing, and geocaching. Thanks for joining us on Oatana Today. Cedar Valley Services, located at the corner of Rose and Grove in Owatonna, provides an array of services for people with disabilities in Steele County. CVS thanks the entire community, especially our business customers, for supporting us in Owatonna for 43 years. Thank you from CVS. Welcome back to the Oatana Today Show, your community connection. It's time for some community announcements. Uh, we have the Penny George Institute for Health and Healing at Oatana Hospital has expanded its retail services by adding healing touch and wellness coaching. To learn more about programs and services at Oatana Hospital's Penny George Institute and outpatient clinic, visit alinahealth.org or to make an appointment call 507-977-2828. Be our guest. Free meals are available each week at Oatana, in Oatana at the following locations. St. Vincent's Table at St. Joseph's Catholic Church, serving from 5.30 to 7 p.m. That's on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, Bethel Community Supper at Bethel Church, 1611 Hemlock Avenue, serving from 5 to 6 p.m. And also on Sunday at Meals of Hope, Trinity Lutheran, 609 Lincoln Avenue, serving 5 to 6.15 p.m. Movie in the Park on Friday, August 11th at Central Park. Uh, the stunning Scotland scenery and heartwarming mother-daughter princess tale with the movie Brave. It will be um, starting at around sunset, maybe 8.30 or so. Come before uh, and have some pre-movie activities. There will be concessions available. Rain date will be on August 12th. Participate in the 14th Avenue Strive Wellness 5K Run and 1.5 mile fitness walk on Saturday August 19th at Owatonna High School. The event is co-sponsored by the Owatonna Noon Rotary and also by Ho Owatonna Hospital, which is a part of Alina Health and Owatonna High School. Proceeds from the Strive, students taking a renewed interest in the value of education. The Wellness Run provides scholarships to high school students participating in Owatonna Rotary's Strive Mentor Program. The Strive Mentor Program matches, a students, uh, matches students who need encouragement through his or her senior year with a Rotary member mentor. Pre-register for the 5K and the 1.5 mile walk by August 16th to take advantage of the reduced $25 registration fee and you can do that at strive.owatonarotaryclub.org. And I think that's probably going to take care of it for today. Well, I'm going to throw out this one, the, the uh, Iowa-Minnesota Pirate Festival. August 12th and 13th, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. at Morehouse. It's going to be a fun time, a new time, a uh, new uh, event for us here in Oatana. And uh, so you want to stop out and see how it is because it may be one of those things that just kind of has some staying power and be, is, com comes back year after year. And that'll do it for today. Come back on Friday when we'll have a Steele County Free Fair preview with Jim Gleason and Todd Hale. You'll want to be back for that one. It'll be for both segments, I might tell you. So at any rate, be well, and I hope to have you back here on Friday. Thanks for being with us today.